just got the rhythm is just there. It's, 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 it's everything about him is rhythm. He's a songwriter and he's a rhythm guitarist. He hardly ever plays lead guitar. Oh wow! He just it's just not something he does. There he is playing at Woodstock with Jimi Hendrix and all these people in this massive band, one of the most successful bands in the in the world. He's seen and respected as a guitar player, but he barely plays a solo. It's all about rhythm. I saw him on um, Later, which is a British TV show um, presented by Jules Holland on the BBC. And uh, he did this thing, he had a, a Schecter the Caster guitar and a little pokey little amp. And he just, oh, man, his guitar playing was formidable. It was like, it's just something going on in his right hand, which is just beyond understanding, you know, he's just, he just, uh-huh, absolutely, you know, and that, it's that right-handed playing which, which I think is really, really important in playing the guitar, but, and the other guy that, 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 I mean, I'm not a massive fan of U2, I mean, I like U2, I'm not a massive fan of them, but The Edge barely plays lead solos, it's all, with, with delays, you know, you never actually, you never actually hear him play a solo. You know. So, rhythm guitar is really important for, for uh, to be a guitarist. You can be a famous guitar player and not play leads, but I don't think you could be a famous guitar player uh, without having a good sense of rhythm. You know. So, uh, I just like. Here it is. I'm green, there it is. <laughs> right, listen, so, listen, so listen to this. This is the drummer. Right. <laughs> Not really what he does, it's what he doesn't do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen to the hi hat. You hear what's happening on the hi hat? And then he changes. Now he's off the hi hat. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's on it, but he's not playing the same pattern. Yeah. And when you hear this music, it just makes you. Oh, well, it makes. I don't know about you, but when I hear this music, I'm like, oh, it just like affects my whole body. You know. You can't. I'm like, I'm, I can't, I'm from Liverpool. I can't dance. <laughs> but but when I hear this music, I just I just want to go. I just want to oh, cuddle up to it. You know. superior whole rhythm thing, you know. So I think um, that's what I wanted to say about um, feel in relation to playing guitar. Um, okay, the other thing is arpeggios, because that's what they say I do. Hello! <laughs> All right. the, the other thing is arpeggios, because I'm kind of known for playing arpeggios. Um, as part of my repertoire. And the thing about arpeggio is, arpeggios is that people think that they're actually, well, I don't know if people think this, but I think no, people well, who don't play the guitar think that it's just some kind of random event. But it isn't. Arpeggios are very specific and very, every string that you hit has to be that string, it has to be accurate, it has to be, again, in time, you know? So if you're playing, um, so if I do something like this. do it again, right, you heard what I just did then, now I'm going to do it again. It's the same, you know. The second one wasn't a random version of the first one. They're both the same. I mean, I'm mean, fucked up a couple of notes here and there, but you know, everybody does that. But the thing is that arpeggios have to be in time, 
They have to be accurate. Your guitar has to be in tune, for God's sake. <laughs> and and uh, you have to be able to uh, hold them back. Because arpeggios can run away from you. Because they're these, they're these things that are like little insects running away from you and your, <laughs> and your fingers and the guitar. But... Does anybody play guitar here? <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> so, you know, so um, I just wanted to make people understand that when you hear, so when you hear Roger McGuinn, you know, when he, when he goes. You know, he's really playing the same thing all the time. The riff is the riff, the arpeggio is the arpeggio, the accuracy is super important, the tuning, and when you think about Roger McGuinn, he didn't have a tuner, but he had an electric 12 string. He used to tune his guitar, and Kenny will, uh, will uh, uh, back me up on this one, because Kenny used to work for Rickenbacker. He used a tuning fork, right? He would tune his guitar with a tuning fork. Can you imagine being backstage in 1967, stoned out of your mind uh, at the whiskey, right? At the whiskey with a whole lot of freaky chicks hanging around you and a whole lot of, lot of freaky dudes with headbands. Um, and he's waiting to get on stage and he would have been going, do it. Holding the, the tuning fork on the, on the the table backstage, <laughs> we would have been going, you see that? I was exactly in tune there as well. Perfect pitch, perfect pitch. And he would have been going, and it was a 12 string. And, it, and it, I'm not sure if he had a little practice amp backstage or how he did it, but he would have, I mean, obviously a, a semi-acoustic Rickenbacker guitar has a sound box on the guitar, so therefore um, you can, you can hear it without having to do this, um, but not if some dude's giving you a joint <laughs> <laughs> and some chick saying, "Hey man, I really love your music. Oh my God. I really, I really love you. You know, I love you." <laughs> you know, so it might be a bit hard to uh, tune the guitar under those circumstances, but um, uh, he would have, and there would have been music going on all over the place. But he was tuning that guitar, and then he'd walk on stage, and he'd play this the, this this guitar in perfect tune and perfect time, and you know, I mean, those if you've ever heard any '60s um, birds live stuff, it's all in tune, which is unbelievable. The same with Jefferson um, Airplane. I met him, Paul Cantner, at the Rickenbacker show. Right, that was a funny moment. He's a guy that plays Rickenbacker 12 string. I went up to him, I was playing with him, it was me and him on the bill. And I went up to him, I walked backstage and he was sitting there, God rest his soul. I went up to him and I went, Marty, right? And he looked at me and he thought that I thought he was Marty Ballin. <laughs> <laughs> And it was like, oh god, embarrassing <laughs> moment, you know, <laughs> it was so embarrassing, and he's a bit of a prickly guy anyway, you know, he's a super smart, he's a bit of, he was a radical guy, he's kind of underrated how important his, his, uh, his uh, political input into the counterculture was in those days, and so he's a bit of a prickly smart, well, let's say God rest his soul, he died last year, or whenever it was, but, um, it was so embarrassing that he th he thought that I thought that he wasn't the person that I was playing with. It was terrible. <laughs> but but um, anyway, I got over it, sort of. Prairie Prince was standing there, the Tubes drummer. He played drums that night. And he played drums that night. And he's about eight foot tall and really <laughs> kind of, in, sort of quite intimidating, actually. And he was drunk, if I remember. It was kind we of all like, were drunk. Yeah. We were drunk. <laughs> yeah. But um, there he, he went on and we had this really fantastic um, technologically uh, advanced monitor system, remember that? Mm -hmm. The PA and monitor system was these tall speaker things where you walked on stage and the sound was coming from all around you. 
There was this sort of yeah, the Bose. Yeah, Bose it was like yeah. a Bose wireless. It was the Bose thing. Yeah. yeah, it was really, really amazing. But again, he, you know, I think Kantner actually still had his headband on, the one he, he would be wearing <laughs> since. <laughs> and uh, he um, he came on stage and he, and he had this row of of. Um, 60s Rickenbacker 12 strings in this guitar rack. And he was picking them out and putting, and putting them on and playing them, and they were, they were all in perfect tune, you know. And everything, you know, it was it's really. I guess I'm going off the point here, but it was quite, <laughs> it was quite interesting being involved with another guy who played Rickenbacker 12 string, who was kind of a, a, an icon from the 60s and um, and played great, you know. And he was the he's a guy who's who's quite underrated as a guitar player. You know, he really. When you talk about guitarists, nobody talks about Paul Kantner. I mean, nobody talks about Paul Kantner. But he was a guy that was also playing the Rickenbacker 12 string as his main instrument before, um, along with Roger McGuinn. I don't know who else was doing it then. Who else was a 60s Rickenbacker? Huh? Yeah. Townsend. Townsend, yeah. Townsend, a bit. Yeah, George Harrison. Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, turtles. Much turtles. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. All, all was real important. Yeah. But all those guys, when they were playing arpeggios, because the thing is, Often when you give a guitar, this is another thing, when you give a guitar to a guitarist who isn't a 12 string player, they go, great, uh, 12 string, oh, okay. You know, and they pick it up and they take it off you and they go, and they go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't really bend the strings very well on this thing, can you? You know, how'd you play blues licks on it, you know? So, um, the, the thing about the 12 string is, is it's, it's, that's, that's not what it's designed for. It's designed for other things. But, it's not a novelty instrument. And a lot of people use it as a novelty instrument. This is the 12 string song, and they pick up a 12 string acoustic. Bowie used 12 string acoustic all the time. I think even, you know, Space, Space Oddity was... Yeah, I was wrong. We had an, an Eston or a, a Eco. Yeah, in a harp tone with only six strings. Oh, is that? <laughs> yeah, that one, the jumbo one you see. Yeah, in the yeah. Yeah. All oh, right, but that was a twelve. Had a twelve-string head, right? Yeah. Um, but um, the other thing is, although you can't use the twelve-string like traditional guitarists find it difficult, really good guitarists find it really difficult to play a 12 string because they can't do the things that they've learned. They can't go, they can't do that on a 12 string because the strings don't bend that way, you know. So the thing is, if you're going to use a 12 string as a lead instrument, you've got to invent a new way of using it, which is where I come in. <laughs> because I use the 12 string more as an instrument where you can play it with a, a back to the rhythm hand. It's all about the rhythm hand. It's not about this hand, it's about this hand. So, you know, when I was playing solos, whenever I was in uh, bands where, I'm, where I've played 12 string, I'm always playing it like this. Like that. And that drives the audience into a frenzy. <laughs> They love that stuff. As soon as you start playing crazy, crazy parts like that, the audience go quite nuts. If I'd been going, they probably wouldn't be as, as interested. But if you get down like this, and I would have to show you how to stand. You have to kind of stand like this, right? Yeah. And you have to be able to, you have to, be able to look people in the eyes and yeah. say, "Cool, I'm here. I'm here. So look out." And then you, you get down and you go. And then you, you think that's the end, but then you can go. And then you can even go. And then you can go. <laughs> because that's the same note. Can you hear that? That is a note in the same key. So. You can take it as far as you like. 